Gracious Heavenly Father, let's pray. We, we thank you for the opportunity to come to church this morning, especially to have a communion service starting the year in such, a, in such an intimate way with you is the best we could receive. We thank you because you are the reason for our lives. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you, God. Thank you for bringing us thus far. And that if it is your will and for your glory, we ask that you will bless us in 2023 in abundant ways that we may honor you and that we may fulfill, fulfill our purpose here on earth. This earth, our life here, is a time of preparation for eternity. And therefore, God, if you are to give us another year, we ask that as individuals and as a church, you will help us fulfill the mission you've given us. Open our eyes and our hearts to what matters most. It's a constant battle and a constant struggle, Lord, between our self and your will. And we pray that you will soften our hearts and help us to give in to the workings of your Holy Spirit. As we open the scriptures together, we pray that you will teach us, guide us, and change us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, today we have a communion service. And there are a few reasons why communion service is special. To me, the communion service is a time for self-examination. It is a time when, in the busyness of my life, I can be away from any devices, and I can consider who I am. You can consider who you are. This is an appropriate time for that. Communion service is also an opportunity for us to reflect on who God is. For us to renew our trust in His love. The communion service is also a time for fellowship because we wash our feet together. We break the bread together. It creates a bond. The communion service is one of probably one of the most intimate times that we have as a church with the Lord. It's a strong connection with heaven, and I'm really glad that you could be here today. If you couldn't be here, connect through the message at least. I've given you some of the reasons why I highly appreciate the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, but does it ever happen to you that during the communion service your mind wanders? Or at times you go through the motions of taking this service and it doesn't really feel like it has that much meaning other than a tradition. You know, this can happen to any of us. And that's why I, I think we should take a, some time before partaking of the communion to dwell on the meaning of the Lord's cup that was at the table. Here we have two cups, and this sermon is entitled, The Two Cups. At the communion, Jesus took a cup, and he blessed, and he gave them, and told them to drink. There's a meaning behind the cup. What does it represent? What does it have to do with you? What does it have to do with the wrath of God? In scripture, the, let me pick up this cup here. The imagery of the cup is related to 
the wrath of the Lord. Take, for example, the text found in Jeremiah. Chapter 25, verse 15, it says, For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take this wine cup of fury from my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. The cup of fury. And the book of Revelation also uses this imagery referring to the wine of God's wrath. And it's, uh, it refers to the cup as the cup of God's indignation. Let's read this verse, Revelation 14, verse 9 to 10. If anyone worship the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of what? The wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. So when Jesus went to the cross, when he was at the cross, Jesus drank the cup, the cup of the full wrath of God on behalf of those who believe in him. You know, in theology, we call this imputation. Imputation. The wrath of God was imputed on him. He took our place, and he imputed his righteousness on us. So, let me ask you, what is the wrath of God? I don't remember, one of these days, there was a product called the wrath of God. I don't remember what the product was. But they have really banalized it by calling a product the wrath of God. I don't know whether it was like a lolly or something that you put in your mouth and then it explodes or something. But what is the wrath of God in scriptures? Do you know? People often think that God's wrath refers to an angry God who is seeking revenge to punish anyone he hates. And they depict the wrath of God that way. But God's wrath is not like our anger. Why not? Because according to the Bible, who is God? What is God? Love. What else do we know about God? He is love. What else is He? Merciful. What else? Just. Is He good? Good. Is He patient? Patient. Okay, if God is good, just merciful, if He is love, how come He has a wrath? Yeah. The Bible says that He is low to anger. So, if He is all that, therefore His wrath has got to be different from my kind of wrath. You have never seen me, my wrath. <laughs> Everybody has a type of wrath, or no, maybe some of you don't. Some of us do. But God's wrath is differently. God's wrath is a holy reaction to anything that is evil. It's like a father who sees his child being abused and steps right in to stop that from happening, even if it needs to attack the assailant. That is God's wrath. God's wrath is, has more to do with justice, with making things right. God's wrath serves to eliminate evil. His wrath is what actually will destroy evil. Without his wrath, evil wouldn't be destroyed. But that's where we find a problem. Because if wrath is what's going to destroy evil forever, and destroy sin forever, I want to remind you all, that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. So that means that we have a sinful what? Nature. If God's wrath destroys sin, what's going to happen to us? Humans are sinners and the divine wrath hangs over us unless and until it is taken away. That's why God's wrath is to be feared. Apart from Christ, 
God's wrath is the worst thing that could happen to you. These days, people don't preach about God's wrath anymore. Guess what I'm going to do today? I'm going to remind you what God's wrath is like. <laughs> what? I don't want to hear. Too bad. Let's read a text found in Revelation 19, verse 11 to 15. Then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowds, crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with what? An iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God. The Almighty, like juice flowing from a white press. Another text, Isaiah 26, 21. See, the Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. Let's go to Nahum. The Lord is slow to get angry. Yes, it's true. But his power is great. And he never lets the guilty go unpunished. Interesting reminder, huh? He displays his power in the whirlwind and the storm. The billowing clouds are the dust beneath his feet. In his presence, the mountains quake and the hills melt away and the earth trembles and its people are destroyed. In his presence, nothing stands. Who can stand before his fierce anger? Is he coming with an anger? Who can survive his burning fury? His rage blazes forth like fire, and the mountains crumble to dust in his presence. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Hebrews 10.31 There's no point of denying that this is in the Bible. Most of us don't like to talk about this part. We don't like this part of the Bible. We'd rather ignore them, these texts. And there's a, there are a lot more. We want to sing how much we're loved by Jesus. But we don't like when we're told that our sins, our choices, our works will bring everlasting destruction upon us. If we don't abandon our sins, our breaking of God's commandments will bring God's wrath upon us. And that is a reality. No wonder that through history, religions have taken hold of this. Many religions have taken hold of the fear of the wrath of God which is a reality, and they used it to control people. You look into the history of the Christian church and the, the false doctrine of hell, that there's a place burning where God's burning people. That's false. That doesn't exist. But religion created that in order to control people. But yes, there will be a day, the Bible says, that when there will be fire. There will be fire that will burn, and a burning fury will come and will Destroy all the wicked. There will be that day. Yes. The fact that religion has told lies and controlled people using the wrath of God does not dismiss the fact that there is a wrath of God. My friends, what is the reality the Bible is saying to the wicked? The presence of God could be the worst thing that they can ever have. The presence of God 
when God appears, the wicked, the sinful, will hurt, will break, and will die. And that is the reality that the Bible presents. The reality of sin. What sin can actually cause. Sinners will face a terrible end. It will be excruciating. It will be horrifying. So it's a reality. Yes, it is. I'm not going to make a list of all the sins. Because I don't have to. Because you know what sin is. You know what wrong is. If you do wrong, you know that you run the risk. I don't have to say. But what I do need to say, as a pastor, as your fellow Christian friend, is that there is a way to be freed from the consequences of God's wrath. There is a way, and you know that. Or maybe you don't know. Or maybe you are uncertain. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You can be saved from God's wrath. God's wrath is going to come whether you want it or not. The earth will be destroyed. Everything we own will be destroyed. But we can be saved. He can set us free from the wrath. And how does he set us free? Why can he set us free? Because the wrath of God was transferred from us to him. One of the most profound moments in the life of Jesus was when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was, you know, facing death the next day. And he said, had a prayer with Jesus. Can you open your Bible in Luke chapter uh, 22? Luke chapter 22. Let's read verse 40 to 42, 44. Luke 20. So this is one of the most profounding moments, experiences that Jesus had. Most profound. And here it says, look, Jesus, he's... How would you feel if you were about to die? Like you knew you were going to die. You knew it was coming. Your death was coming. This is Jesus. He's facing death. And he says this to the Father, verse 40. Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Take this cup away from me. What cup is he talking about? What cup is Jesus referring to? Is it Jesus? Is Jesus holding a cup there in the garden? No. So obviously he's speaking figuratively. What cup is he referring to? The cup of the wrath of God. The cup of indignation. The cup that brings destruction over what? Sin. Why is Jesus asking God to take the cup away from him? Why? Why does... Why, why is the cup going to be given to Jesus? Why? Why is he going to face God's wrath? Why? Yeah, because only sinners face God's wrath. But Jesus was not a sinner. How come he was going to face the wrath of God? Because our sins were going to be put on him. And so he says, I don't want it, God. I know how terrible it is. I know how terrible God's wrath is. Nevertheless... Not my will, but your will be done. And being in agony. Look, the Bible adds this detail there. Jesus knows what the wrath of God is like, and he's in agony. And he prayed more earnestly. And he was in such agony that what happened to his sweat turned into blood. It's possible. Eh? Science says that if you get 
such an intense agony that your blood can turn into sweat. It's possible. Can you imagine? And it says here that he fell onto the ground. He, he fell onto the ground without strength. He's not quite ready to go to the cross. You know, for quite a while, he knew that he was going to die. This did not surprise him. The disciples were always telling him, you're not going to die, Jesus. Don't worry. But he knew. He knew his death was coming. He full well knew. And yet, even though he knew all that, in this moment, he's trembling in fear. It's interesting because up to this moment, I think Jesus was the only person in history who never had a reason to be afraid of God. Why did Jesus not have a reason to be afraid of God? Does anyone know? Because he was sinless. If you have no sin, you have no fear of the presence of God. The wrath of God can't do anything to you. Jesus had no reason to be afraid. He was one with the Father. He was perfectly righteous. And I don't think that Jesus was scared to die either. He was not scared of the pain that was going to be inflicted upon him. I don't think he was scared of that. Because he had known that from the scriptures for a long time. And he was going ahead with it. That's not what he was scared of. What was Jesus scared of? What was Jesus afraid of, my friends? There's so many different answers here. Separation, taking our sins, the wrath of God. Why was Jesus scared? Separation could be permanent. Before coming to the earth, Jesus had been the most exalted in the whole universe. He, he had a perfect communion with the Father. He was adored by the entire universe, the King of kings, the peers of all. But in this moment, he took my sin and your sin upon him, and he was scared. It's shocking to consider. You know, when he was here on earth, he ministered, he was so good, and yet people mistreated him. He was beaten, he was re rejected, he was despised, he was crucified. But knowing the world and knowing what people like, I'm not surprised by that. We all get despised, we all get moments when we are mistreated. Jesus got that too, so we shouldn't be that surprised. That's our sinful world. But what's shocking and surprising for me is that he was going to face the wrath of the Father. His Father, his own Father. That is shocking. Bearing our sins. He who had never committed a sin. In this moment, he was afraid of God. The weight of the reality of our sin was bearing upon him. And he didn't want to do anything to do with it. He was so afraid. He, and this is another thing that amazes me. Jesus did not have to bear the weight of my sin. He didn't have to do this. He didn't have to. He didn't have to drink from that cup. And I'm still asking myself, Why? Because oh, Jesus loves you. I know, but why? What have I done for Jesus that deserves him taking that cup of the wrath for me? And yet he chose to go ahead and do it for you. Carrying an alien guilt upon himself and he trembled. The Bible says, in agony, sweating blood, falling to the ground. Jesus trembled. But what about us? What is, what is going on with us that so many times we, often we lose sense of this fear of the wrath of God? So often we lose sense of a fear of sinning and facing the wrath. How can we? 
How can we live without being afraid of the wrath of God? And don't get me wrong here. here I'm, not, I don't, I'm not saying that you need to live feeling guilty, okay? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you should carry the guilt of your sins forever, but you, you have to believe that if you truly repent, that God is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse you. He will. But the problem is that many of us presum presumptuously, do you know this word? presumption we presumptuously go on sinning as if we had a divine forgiveness that came to us like a, a blank check huh? a blank checkbook that will excuse our depraved lack of resolution to abandon our evil ways do you see what the problem is with us so many times We know we're doing something wrong, and we like it, and we decide we decide we don't want to let go of it, and that's the biggest problem with us. That's the biggest problem with you and I. And if we enter 2023 and we're holding on to pet sins or things in our life that we know we shouldn't do, but we continue doing, we have to stop with it right now. I needed to. Because if we hang on to our sinful lives, do you know what we're going to be taken back? The cup of the wrath. And that could be the worst, that is the worst thing that anybody would need to face. Let me read, let's read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 to 27. Listen to what the author, he, he's, he's, he's spinning a letter to you and me, and it says, Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. Do you see how the Bible is saying there is no chain, uh, white blank blank check given to the sinner? Saying, hey, just go on. You keep doing whatever you're doing. Jesus will forgive you anyway. It's, look, the Bible is saying that's not true. The Bible is saying there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins of people who continue sinning deliberately, my dear friends. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone, anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses back in those days, they were put to death without mercy on the, on the witnesses of two or three witnesses. You know, some people say, wow, how come things were so tough? In the time of Israel. Have you ever heard somebody say, they look at the laws at the time of Israel. Ah, oh, if somebody broke a law or something, they were stoned. Why was it so severe, right? Have you ever heard people saying this? Why was God so severe? God is different in the Old Testament than the New Testament. Have you heard this? Do you know why things were so tough with the law of Moses? Because the law that deals with our sin is even worse. It's even tougher. And God wanted us to know that. He wanted us to know that. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God. And have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy. As if it were common and unholy. And have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. Oh, God, have mercy on us. The reason why I'm telling you and we're talking about the, the wrath of God is because I want you to understand, before we go into the communion, the magnitude of what happened on the cross. Do you realize the weight of your sin, of our sin? Jesus, who had no sin, trembled at the mere thought of bearing our guilt. And here we are, fully undeserved of the, in the undeserving of the, the mercy of God. 
and uh, we don't seem to wink an eye when we keep on sinning and we just turn to Jesus and we give him a high five and we say, thanks, bro. Somehow, that attitude just doesn't seem to fit with what person who understands what this wrath of God is about. And I hope today you are rethinking. Remember when I told you at the start, communion service is a good time to self or self-examination. Perhaps while I was talking here, you were thinking, I don't want to continue sinning. Blessed are those who come to that realization. Woe to me. Sinful, I need help. Blessed is the person, the sinner, who realizes his or her need of Jesus. Did you know that that's one of the biggest blessings you can have in your life? Nobody here is perfect. Nobody. Nobody here has got everything right. It's true. And God loves you still. But the biggest blessing... It's when you and me and I realize that we need Jesus. We need a Savior. And we're blessed for coming to this com service, to this communion. As the Bible says to us, it was not God's intention that we experience His anger, but that we obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus. If one side of imputation. Jesus takes the wrath of God on himself. On the other side of imputation is when he gives to us his mercy, his justice, his righteousness. Not only Jesus bears our guilt, our shame on the cross and pays the penalty for our sins, but he transfers to us an incredible amount of blessing. He transfers blessings to all who believe and participate in him. As David said in Psalm 23, you know this one. You, Lord, prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall overflow. Follow me in the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus, David said, the Lord fills my cup with something overflowing, overflowing blessings. He helps us enter heaven. He helps us go from being enemies to being sons and daughters of God. You know, God sets a table before our enemies. Who is our biggest enemy? Who is our biggest enemy? Who is your biggest enemy? Say it. Who? Satan is your biggest enemy. And then yourself. <laughs> Yeah? Satan, and then who else is your enemy? Yourself. God sets a table before your enemy. You know, Satan watches helpless, helplessly as the blood of Christ sets us free. The Revelation says that we defeat the dragon by the blood of the Lamb. As long as we are holding on to Jesus, we're safe, and the enemy cannot snatch us from the Father's hands. Jesus, he drank the cup of the wrath of God but he has also, and he is enabling us today to drink out of the cup of his blessing. And he runs over. You can keep drinking out of this blessing and drinking. And it doesn't end because it's overflowing. It's going everywhere. When I was a kid, that's how I used to fill up glasses. I would just keep pouring. It would go everywhere. And I was happy because I had juice all over me. My parents weren't happy. But I was, because I had abundance. And Jesus, according to David, he is ready to put so many blessings in your life. We're covered in blessings for that reason. When you take the communion service today, I want to challenge you to think about what the cup represents. You hear that God is loving and gracious but we still run the risk of forgetting that this love came at a high price. The price of the blood of the Lord. The price of your life. 
was the blood of the Lord. Last verse, open to Luke 22, 20. Luke 22, 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Concluding, my friends, every time we drink the cup, we're supposed to be reminded that the blood of Christ was spilled for us. We're supposed to remember that this cup symbolizes the death of our Lord, Savior, our friend, Jesus. Why did he have to die? Why? Why did he have to die? Why, why was his body, had, did his body have to be broken and his blood need to be spilled? Why? Why? Because you were born infected with sin. This was your destiny to drink out of this cup of the wrath. You were supposed to die forever. But Jesus took and drank that cup. He chose to die on our behalf. Because the wrath of God must be satisfied. Penalty for sin needs to be paid. So he paid. That should be us. He took our place. So after you heard everything you heard today. What is your response? What are you going to do? How do you take this from a, a teaching, a reading, into practice? Actually, I actually want to hear from you. <laughs> Can you give me any idea? What do we need to do now? We need to accept, believe it, accept it, yeah. What else? What, what do we do now? Surrender. Oh, so it means let go of self, humble, accept, humbly accept. Anything else? Ask the question, what do you want me to do, Jesus? Anything else? Die daily to self. Remember this text that we read here in uh, Hebrews. If we deliberately continue sinning. What does that hint you at? What should we do? Stop sinning. Stop sinning. Yeah, I'm just saying. I'm just saying what nobody's saying. Stop sinning. <laughs> yeah, we got to stop sinning. Oh, but now, why are we believing that it's impossible? You know who tells you it's impossible? Satan. Satan is the one who's telling us it's impossible to stop sinning. It's impossible for you to lose your sinful nature. But it is possible for you to stop sinning if you choose so. Yes. Habits can change through the work of the Holy Spirit. What is your resolution for 2023? Does that include stop sinning? You know, it's always been mine since I've been a Christian. <laughs> and that's my desire. Because I don't want to face the wrath of God. As long as I want to stop sinning, even if I haven't, but as long as I want, I'm safe. That's the deal. That's the secret. As long as you want it, you look for it, you plead for God's help for you to stop breaking his laws, you are safe in his hands. Today, we're going to participate and we're going to do what he asked of us. He asked us to take the communion to remember. He asked to do the foot washing. It's an opportunity. When you do the foot washing, it's when you confess to God and to someone else a sin. You confess in your mind. And if you have something with someone, you confess. And, and Jesus, went, he, he did the foot washing so people would realize that he washes you. He really does. And then when you take the bread and the wine, he really fills you up with abundant blessings. Not with this wrath, but with this salvation. So, 
I want to, if you want to say thank you to Jesus today, I want to plead with every one of you to participate in the service. You don't have to be a church member. You, you can be from, you know, you don't have to be uh, this week. You don't need to be, a, even if you were not a perfect person, even if you sinned today, even take the communion. Why? Because that's when you're telling Jesus, I need you. When you don't take the communion, you're telling Jesus what? I don't need you. I'm good enough. I can face the wrath of God on my own. Uh-uh. That's why, please, Jesus gave us the communion for us to know how much we need him. And I want to encourage every one of you today, participate in the foot washing, in the taking of the bread and the wine. We want to say to Jesus, thank you by obeying his word. Show your faith through actions. Show to him that you are committed in 2023. You're going to start 2023 with a communion. To show to Jesus that we're committed to walk in his ways. Amen? Are you? Shall we pray? Father, we're going to go do the ordinances as you asked. To show you now that we want it. We want you. We need you. And we want to surrender ourselves. Our action now is an action of surrender. Please, Lord, bless us. May our cup runs over, run over with blessings, not the wrath. Thank you for your help and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 6, verses 53 to 57. Jesus said to them, I am telling you the truth. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in yourselves. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him to life on the last day. For my flesh is the real food, my blood the real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in him. The living Father sent me, and because of him I live also. In the same way, whoever eats me will live because of me. Thank you. First Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same now, The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. What we are doing here is what Jesus did. He did it with the intention of letting you know that he has done it everything that is necessary for you to be saved. This here is an assurance that he has done everything. All you need is to accept him into your life. After saying these things, he took the bread and he broke the bread, representing his body being broken for our sins. Shall we break the bread?
he was crushed, he was bruised for our transgressions. The wrath of God was placed on him so that we could find peace. Praise Jesus. Are you grateful? Shall we give thanks? After breaking the bread, we gave thanks. We're going to heal those of you who can. We're going to have two prayers. I'm thanking God for breaking his body. And thanking God for pouring his blood, which signed off our eternal life. Those of you who can, could you please kneel down? Dear Lord, we thank you for coming to this earth in a form of human flesh like us. And we also thank you for condescending down to this form with indeed even the purpose to die, that your body may be bruised and broken. We thank you for this closeness you have given with us, that you too may be, uh, that you too came to experience flesh like us, that we may have a high priest who knows all that we go through. And we thank you for this memory of your body that was broken for us. Amen. Father, thank you for dying on the cross. Not because we deserve it, but you die there for us. But you die there because you love us more. Lord, as we participate in this communion service today, may this be not just a ritual for us, but a remembrance of your great sacrifice that you made for, for all of us so that we'll have that opportunity to be with you once again. Lord, help us that to, as we participated in this program, in this service today, that we'll have a, be able to reunite, renew our spirit, our relationship with you and everybody else. May we continue to become blessings for others as you continue to bless us, Lord. Thank you for the blood that was spelled on the cross for our sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Those of you who are participating may take um, a bread and a juice and wait until at the end I say so, we will eat and drink together. So just hold on to, to it until it's time to eat together. While you are waiting, it's a good chance, a good opportunity to pray. What are the things that you want to thank the Lord? What are the things that you want to, to surrender to Him? Is there any area of your life that you know has been troublesome? That you want to confess, that you want to give to Him right now? This is a moment that you can tell Him.
just want to encourage you to look at the emblems that are on your hand, the symbols that are on your hand. You have the bread and the juice. And I want you to, every time that you take these juice, the grape juice, here in the communion service, that you remember that Jesus, he drank the bitter cup of the wrath of God so that you could drink the sweet cup of God's grace. He really loves you. You may now participate together in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us. Amen. Wonderful Lord, we want to once again say to you thank you. It's been a wonderful um, morning, a wonderful time with spent together in your presence. We uh, leave this place with our hope, with our faith renewed. Uh, we we feel like we are overflowing in blessing, like our cup runs over. Thank you, Lord, for pouring the best upon us. Thank you for taking from us our guilt, our shame, and the wrath of God and giving us salvation and eternal life. Bless, Lord, every person. Sure, we are still facing some difficulties, our challenges in this life, but we are not alone. And we know that you are going before us. We have nothing to fear, for Christ is our Savior. Together, the church prays, Amen.